Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. If you're a visitor to Newbury Court, welcome. My name is Jill Crowley, and I'm the program coordinator here at Newbury Court. It's my honor to welcome all of you to the third annual Chuck Roth Memorial Lecture. To start, I'd like to say a few words about Chuck Roth. Chuck enjoyed a long and distinguished career as an educator in environmental education. Nationally known as the father of environmental literacy, Chuck devoted more than three decades to shaping environmental education in Massachusetts and mentoring many of the nation's top environmental educators. A former biology teacher, nature camp director, author and illustrator, he was a lifelong advocate for environmental causes. Chuck designed and supervised education programs for the Massachusetts Audubon Society from 1960 to 1988. He developed exhibits and programs for Drumlin Farm, planned in-service teacher training programs, and trained nature counselors across the New England region. He also authored, illustrated, or co-authored several books about nature and the environment. He spent his last few years living here at Newbury Court, where he made several new friends among his fellow residents and staff, and helped to organize a lecture series on wildlife and environmental issues. It seemed fitting then to memorialize him by arranging a lecture series on the subjects he held dear, and his close friend, Ellie Horowitz, decided to make that happen. Ellie is here tonight, and she will be introducing our speaker. Ellie has been described in at least one place as a Renaissance woman who, and I'm stealing somebody's words here, is as much at home filming lions and buffalo in Africa or turkey hunting in Massachusetts as she is attending an opera or ballet. A professional wildlife biologist, she helped form the Secretary's Advisory Group on Environmental Education and worked to develop the Massachusetts Environmental Education Plan and the Massachusetts Environmental Frameworks. She has been a lead instructor for the North American Environmental Educators Project for Excellence in Environmental Education, developing conservation education materials at the national level. And Ellie spent 34 years as Chief of Information and Education for Massachusetts Division of Fisheries and Wildlife. Won't you help me welcome Ellie Horowitz. That's quite an introduction. I'm not sure I can live up to that. <coughs> there are more words in that, Jill, than... However, uh, it's my great pleasure to be here because this was something really important. Chuck's family, when he passed away, wanted to do something special so that people would follow in his tracks. He was always a consummate naturalist and loved sharing this with people. He wasn't a well of knowledge, he was a bubbling spring of knowledge, and it just kind of came up. So over the years, we have chosen to pick people who are total experts in their field and exciting people who will come and share this with us. And I don't know how many of you have been here for the previous two lectures we had. The first one was on fireflies, the last one was last year on black bears and bear behavior. And this year, we are particularly fortunate to have a program on peregrine falcons. And the most important part being the recovery of peregrines, because they were gone. It just goes to show that if you have the right people in the right places, you can reverse bad things. And so we are particularly blessed this evening to have with us Dr. Tom French, who has he joined the Division of Fisheries and Wildlife as the Director of the Natural Heritage and Endangered Species Program in 1984. Tom holds master's degrees, doctor's degrees, did graduate work, postgraduate work at Cornell, and I'm not going to go into all the honors he's received and all the positions he's held because we're not here to hear about Tom, we're up here to hear from Tom and hear about peregrines. But Tom is the man who, to the extent that anyone did it, he single-handedly brought peregrines back to Massachusetts. And he is going to share with us some of his adventures in doing this. 
So please join me in welcoming Tom French. Thank you. First thing we're going to do is see about getting the sound so everybody can hear. I want to be sure we're all set with that. Can you hear me? The last, back in the back, you can hear me fine. All right, and are we good on the sound for the camera? Okay, wonderful. Um, first, I am humbled to be a part of the Chuck Roth uh, lecture series. I met Chuck in 1984 when I started. He was still working with Mass Audubon at Drumlin Farm, uh, a fascinating person. And indeed, the one thing he has done is in, my, in regards to my changing my uh, vocabulary is environmental literacy is a term that I actually use fairly often. It's what we want to strive for for the public, have a public that has an understanding or a knowledge of environmental issues. Um, and it's what we want to strive for for our school curricula and uh, the education our children get. One is environmental literacy. They don't need to be scientists. They don't need to be environmental activists or anything of the sort. Just literate. Understands, like reading and writing. Understand environmental issues. So, I have 38 slides. I'm going to have to keep moving because I, I can digress on every single slide. <laughs> and so, do sort of the, that sort of thing if we need to speed it up. How many of you in this room have seen a wild peregrine falcon? Wow, I'm impressed. Good number of people. I don't know if I saw you raise your hand, uh, Dave. Did you raise your hand? Okay. Um, <laughs> Dave and Ursula Godine are two of our most active volunteers watching our peregrine nests across the state, so they'll recognize some of the birds we have today. So I'm going to get started because I do need to keep this moving. I have just recently retired. Um, I'm not quite sure how that works yet, so three months. I'm still this year going to be active in banding all the peregrine falcons, so I'm still doing, doing the fun work and uh, hope to keep that up. But this is an amazing story uh, where we've had a, a very, a, essentially a complete recovery of a species that was, was gone from the state. So Rachel Carson is the person that made it public what the harm of DDT was doing to our environment. It nearly wiped out a lot of different species, peregrine falcons included, but bald eagles, pelicans, Indiana bats, and a wide range of other things. Uh, interestingly, Archie Hager uh, is a quite well-known person himself, being our state ornithologist in the 1940s. In his observations uh, at Lighthouse Hill, uh, what's now the west side of the Prescott Peninsula at Quabbin, the year Quabbin filled, he noted that the eggs in the nest were broken for some unknown reason. Well, DDT was producing thin-shelled eggs. They were breaking, the chicks weren't hatching, and when the parents died, there were no young to replace them. So that's how it, how it worked and how they disappeared very rapidly in Massachusetts and across the country. 1948 was when his observation was made, and by 1955, we had our last nesting pair on Monument Mountain in the Berkshires. The most, one of the most famous peregrine falcon nests in the country was right here in Massachusetts, Mount Tom. When I sent this photograph to Tom Cade, who ran the peregrine fund, who took falconry birds, brought them together at Cornell and Ithaca, and had them produce captive-born chicks that we used to the, for the restoration, when I showed him this on Mount Tom, he simply emailed me back, now I can die happy. And he passed away about three months ago. Oh. So he just has, he had a wonderful career. Uh, but we see that 1966, there were no peregrine falcons nesting in the entire eastern United States. They were all gone. There were still some in the west. They were still up in high, high parts of Canada. Uh, and, there, and the peregrine occurs in Europe and Asia, Australia. So it's worldwide, but it's very susceptible to DDT. DDT was banned in 1972. So the Peregrine Fund was ready to start releasing chicks by 1974, right after that. And this is what a peregrine falcon nest looks like. This is the typical wild peregrine nest site. It's a cliff. 
They're a bird that does not bring one single item to a nest. There's no nest built. They don't bring a stick. They don't bring anything. They simply make a depression in the soil and gravel on the cliff ledge. Just enough to cradle the eggs. And ironically, they can incubate those eggs on gravel and they don't break if they're thick shelled as they should be. So they don't need something soft, no fur, no feathers, no straw, but they need something. And as you can see, the view is spectacular. <laughs> the chicks have a very tenuous place to stand. You wonder about, oh my word, I wouldn't trust anything that close to the edge. They are literally inches from the edge of sites that could be two and three hundred feet off the ground. But they're evolved that way. They're evolved to nest and grow up on cliffs. But when they spread out across the country and they come to places like eastern Massachusetts, we don't have cliffs on our coast. And so as humans have created these big structures, they have been attracted to them just fine. Now, however, think about it. You build a bridge or a marble or concrete building, there's no soft spots, there's no gravel. So the kind of places they seek are places where the pigeons have been nesting. And you get pigeon nests or just accumulated pigeon poo, a nest of poo. That's what they have often used. Or they just lay on the bare steel or concrete and sometimes they can pull it off more often than not they cannot. So one of the things I'm going to do is go through some of our nest sites so you'll just get to see the variety of places they nest. My favorite building in the whole state, the Custom House in downtown Boston, when it was occupied by the federal government, it's now a Marriott Timeshare Vacation Club, very high end, but the Fish and Wildlife Service used to have their uh, office on the 19th floor. We had customs. It was a customs building. You could see out over the harbor when there were sailing vessels and see the boats coming in and go intercept them to get the taxes and whatnot. They let me, when the go federal government owned it, go up to that topmost window overlooking the New England Aquarium and use a pry bar and pull it out and put a nest inside the building, a box inside the building. I literally pull the window out with a pry bar. And that top part is like a, like a lighthouse. It's a spiral staircase, three stories of spiral staircase. Beautiful. And of course, New Bedford, um, excuse me, Fall River, Battleship Cove, Fall River. That's the Braga Bridge, two miles of Interstate I-195, I believe. Uh, and then here's Mount Sugarloaf in Deerfield. That's a, an actual natural cliff, parking lot right there on the top. So these are the kinds of places in mass they, they nest. And you might get a very nice, wild looking nest site. Here is, um, and the other thing I'm gonna talk about a lot are these bands. There's a silver band and there's a black over green color band on that left leg. And that color band is the way we can get photographers and birders with binoculars and telescopes to read the leg band that we put on when they're chicks. And then we can know the story of that bird. We know where they came from. We band them in the nest as chicks usually. And here we have a bird, nine over D, and we know it came from Binghamton, Binghamton New York in 2013, and this is 2015 when the photo was taken. They usually breed as two-year-olds, but every now and then, and we've had this happen half a dozen times, you'll get a juvenile plumaged brown bird. It's not even looking like the adult yet, that can nest and lay eggs and raise four chicks and it's one year old. And so that, people didn't used to think, the more we do this, the more exceptions to the rules we start to see. And we see things like multiple adults that nest. Go to the uh, nest camera in Springfield right now. Just Google Springfield Peregrine. You can find the link. And there's two females, one's in juvenile plumage, and one male. There's three adults raising those chicks. So this looks all natural and great and wonderful. This is an abandoned quarry. It's still man-made. And this is actually on Mount Tom, Mount Tom Quarry. Here, this is the Federal Reserve Bank. On the 32nd floor, the president of the Federal Reserve Bank 
has a sliding glass door out her beautiful mahogany office out onto a garden patio on the 32nd floor and here's a Japanese maple tree and the nest is in the soil below the Japanese maple. So we have the one in Chicago, if you saw Nova, is nesting in a nest planter box on a condo building about 30 stories up. We had that happen in Worcester where they were nesting in the soil of a, of a potted plant. Um, but that's me with my helmet. Now you might have be able to figure out why I wear a helmet. Those talons are pretty sharp. But there she is underneath that, that maple tree, right? Actually, no, she's underneath that juniper, I forgot. She's right there. So when I walked out there, getting those chicks is not easy because she comes marching right out to confront me. Peregrine falcons are very wonderful, protective parents. And the ones that grow up in the cities near people, they're not impressed with people anymore. <laughs> they're not afraid of us. No, people ask, how do you know where to put a nest box? So the nest box concept is here's the box, got a perch pole. This is on, um, uh, is it the Sheridan Hotel right across from the Christian Science Church building. And it's got gravel in it. Well, here's the reason we put it up, because here's where they nested. They nested on the rubberized roof with nails and just loose gravel from construction, and it's not even on the gravel part. And so, now you, this is one egg. The other two eggs are too far out of sight to get in the camera shot. They roll all over the place. They can't keep them together. So we try to build a box that has gravel, a perch pole, and a roof over their heads. So they don't get rained on. Well, they, they don't. They, they, they're, they're like a backhoe. They go out to find an egg and they put the, their beak down and like a backhoe would, they pull, pull it in and they go get another one and they pull it in. And if they have it in a gravel depression, a nest scrape, it stays, the clutch stays together and they can incubate them safely. So, as I say, one of the things we do, we, we really focus on trying to do it, is banding as many as we can. So here's what it looks like. Here's E over, e over zero. This was in, um, in Worcester. And um, that's one of our staff uh, putting the bands on. And he's losing his big, it's not pliers, it's actually uh, a rivet gun. Because these birds will pull a band off unless it's firmly in place. So we use rivets on one band and the other band has a lip that folds over on itself so they cannot get them off. And so they go around life with two bracelets. It does not hurt them a bit. They live, they last as long as the bird lives and it gives us, oh, this is interesting, never done that before. <laughs> um, huh, recognize anybody? I'll put the, 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 the red mark on uh, Ursula and Dave who are in the audience and this is the way we find our new nest sites. We found a new nest site Two days ago, I think, downtown Boston, 99 Summer Street on one of the uh, big um, financial investment buildings, uh, nesting on a rubberized roof. So here's, here's just a couple of examples. We have a custom house. This is looking out on the, from the, inside the box. I'm inside the box looking out the perch pole. And that's the New England Aquarium right there. And that's where the whale watch boats start off right there, going out into Boston Harbor towards the airport. So, if you look, first started in 1987, it was our first nest since recovery began. And it's because we released young chicks from the Peregrine Fund in downtown Boston. In, in 1984, we released chicks. In 85, in 87, we had our first nest. It's had four resident males and six resident females. Now, what does that mean? Peregrine falcons mate for life. Well, what's that mean? That means when the female falcon and the male falcon have gotten together, they stay together until death do us part. But they don't mourn for a moment. And so as soon as one dies, it's replaced. The other one dies, it's replaced. And so you keep this leapfrogging for, forever. Absolutely forever. It could go on for hundreds of years at the same spot if it's a good site. So we're up to four, four different males, six different females over 30 years, 132 eggs, 91 chicks and 10 documented mortalities after they fledged. How will we do the questions when we get to the end, okay? Okay, remember your question. Um, so we've had chicks that have turned up 
Six in Massachusetts, three in Rhode Island, one in New York, two in New Jersey. Give you an idea of how they move around. The first year, these young chicks will go farther. They'll go fairly far south, but they'll come back to the region. But we have birds that are nesting in Pennsylvania, in New Jersey, New York, New Hampshire, that have been born here in Massachusetts. Springfield, this is the one you, that I said has a, a juvenile plumaged adult female now that is with this female, and actually this individual female right here. Uh, this is Monarch Place. The nest, this, this level right here on the 20, I think it's the 20, 22nd floor, I believe, the only ledge on the building, and so we put this tray, this tray right here made out of plexiglass on that ledge. And the reason was Peter Pignelli. Anybody know that name? Peter Pignelli, Peter Pan Bus Lines? He's passed away now, but he, he, he was the money baron for Springfield. He owned that building. He had the paddle boat on the river, he had, or his pontoon boat, I guess it was, uh, kind of a tour boat, and he has the bus lines. Uh, he passed away, so it's come down through the family, but he didn't want the nest tray to change the lines of the building so you can see through, but now they've become famous for it. That was one of the first nest cameras in the country was here, before anything was digital, before anything was remote. It was hardwired down the utility poles from the control panel in the, in the studio to the building, to the camera. Um, so that's a wonderful spot, and this is the Falcon Cam. This was the Falcon Channel. They devoted a public access channel to the birds, 24 hours a day. As I say, one of the very first in the country. It was live TV. People were addicted to watching the Peyton Place of Peregrine Falcon families. And let me tell you, there's drama. All the time, there's some kind of drama. The part that people really don't like is when that drama includes one of the chicks dying on camera. That's hard for the public to take. Interestingly, though, what I like about it is people become interested that have no previous history of being interested in anything wild because they get attached to the personalities of the individual birds. So they really do, they, they end up learning about the birds by accident. They're learning about nature by accident. So here's a Worcester. Give, give you an idea of the makeup and where some of our birds come from. So here's a female, E over O, we saw her earlier. Uh, in 2001, she was 10 years old. She came from a cliff nest in Vermont. People often ask me, well, if they were born on a cliff, they're gonna go nest on a cliff, right? No, not really. Here is the male, three over seven, born in Portsmouth Navy shipyard on a mothball ship. So, six years old. They're both banded. I can follow them. I don't know why it's doing this, but we'll just keep punching through it. And here's their young. So this will show you what a juvenile peregrine falcon looks like. They're brown and heavily streaked on the front. And this is the plumage that the other bird in uh, Springfield, that's what it looks like right now. So this is acting as a, a nest helper. And these are the bands that we've just put on. They've just been there on these birds for a couple of weeks. Here is an example. This was the Bancroft building in Worcester. Anybody know the Bancroft building? You do? Okay. The Bancroft building was a high-end um, hotel in Springfield, right on the town common by the, by the town hall, city hall. And now it's a very low-rent uh, apartment building. And on that corner where that arrow is, right there, um, we put a nest tray 17 years before it first got used. So where we put them doesn't necessarily work quickly or even at all. By the time the birds used it, the two by four frame I had used, and this, didn't, this wasn't a box, it didn't have a roof, it was just a frame with gravel in it, it had rotted away. All it was was a pile of gravel and loose bits of splintered rotted wood. But it worked, it was gravel. Now, the other thing is OSHA. Everybody know what OSHA is? Yeah, well, I got into it early enough. I didn't worry, need to worry about OSHA. And so I didn't need to worry about following all these safety rules. I went out that window right there, which is an apartment building, and I had my harness and I had my climbing rope. But what do you tie off to in an apartment? Well, the only thing big enough that wouldn't go out the door was the sofa. So I tied off on the sofa, <laughs> figuring if I fell, 
it would be quite the start for the first four or five or six feet. But once that sofa caught in that window, I wasn't going to go anywhere. <laughs> so, so, and that's a, that's a two foot wide ledge, so that's no problem. It's really wide, two feet wide. So here's the Du Bois Library at UMass Amherst. We have the nest box right there on the very, very, very top. I wanted it on the, <clears throat> on the ledges right here part way up where the air conditioning units are behind it. I thought the very top was going to be too windy, too, uh, too uh, exposed. And that was true, it was, but they did use it. And the reason they wanted it, they wanted it up high because this is one of the libraries, both the UMass Library in Amherst and the UMass campus in Boston had the horrible reputation because they put too much brick up and the brick started falling off the building. And so there's chain link fences around the base of the building so you can get nowhere near it. They wanted something positive for people to see when they looked at the building <laughs> instead of the, the bad reputation of bricks that slough off. And so here's Dave Fuller in our district. This, this is the age we like to get them to band, about three weeks old. They're like puppies. At three weeks old, they have really, really big feet. And then later they grow into them. And so at three weeks old, we can put a band on them and their legs aren't gonna get any thicker and their feet aren't gonna get any bigger. So that's, that's what we like to do. And at three weeks old, they're just little butterballs. They really aren't gonna fight. They're just really easy to handle. When we don't know how old they are, we sometimes get up there and they're five weeks old. And that's when I wear gloves and I lose some blood anyway because they're grabbing at everything. And uh, so, but they're, they're adorable. This actually became a postcard for the library. They use that as a, uh, a they have it in a sticker form and you can put on your windows or wherever. And as you can see, mom is not terribly afraid. If, you were to, if he were to put his hand up there, she'd grab it. And here is, um, Looking in, they, have, they, they probably have the best camera in the state, uh, UMass Amherst. You can go, and again, go to Google, look it up, and you can plug right into this real time. This camera can pan, and it can zoom in and out. So when we got a new bird, I wanted to know what the band number is. All I had to do was call, ask them, say, oh, when the mail comes in next, I want you to zoom in on its leg. So all the public is seeing this too, but for some reason we're sitting here looking at this beautiful picture of peregrines, and then suddenly the camera goes right in on just the leg. And you can read the number, I said, got it. So um, we use this, this is a little, uh, kind of a, a, a wall inside the box. So the chicks, if they need to, they can get around behind it and feel, feel comfortable and safe behind it. It's a nice little design that's worked for us real well. Here's a box at UMass Lowell. Now in this case, UMass Lowell did not like our Spartan design of nest boxes, which is just <laughs> pressure treated plywood. They built their own that has clabbers and, and asphalt <laughs> shingles. And uh, they have two cameras. They have one that looks from the top inside of the nest and they have this other one that looks at the, at the perch pole. So if you wanna get Two views, go to UMass Lowell's camera. And you can go to Paris and look at their pa falcons, or you can go to you know, San Francisco and look at their peregrines. The, today is amazing what you can do with links in the internet. So we have been getting calls from, now I can't remember which site this is, I think it's Amherst, oh, excuse me, I think it's the uh, Custom House camera. We, we have a person who's been contacting us by email actually from Australia who's addicted to that particular pair. She is sitting in Australia following it every single day. So, she doesn't like me. I told you they're protective. She really knows me. I've been d banding her chicks for 10 years straight and she really, really, really doesn't like me. <laughs> but, on the other hand, it doesn't hurt her chicks. She goes right back to incubating them as soon as we leave. She's just letting us know that she's there to protect them. If I were a raccoon, she'd knock me off the building. So that's what it's all about, is to be protective of the nest. So here's UMass Boston, the dorm building. And so you can look from, from the box right here, we're looking behind it, look towards the city, see the Prudential building. And you know, that's the silhouette of a sharp, long pointed wings of a falcon. Remember, fastest flying bird in the world. 
Not flat flight so much, 50 miles an hour maybe, which is still very fast for a bird. They co-evolved, about 50. They co-evolved on cliffs in the British Isles with pigeons. Our city pigeons come from there, and they're about evenly matched. A pigeon can often outrun a peregrine falcon, but when they go up high and see a bird flying past lower, they go into a stoop, which is a dive, which they are so aerodynamic, they can out distance a skydiver, because the skydiver's got so much wind resistance, and they can go down to up to 220 miles an hour in a, in a controlled dive. That's the fastest speed recorded. And so they are incredibly efficient hunters. They only hunt, except up in the Arctic tundra and some odd places, only hunt birds flying in the air. If you're going that fast, you can't turn on a dime. They don't come into the city skyscraper canyons and chase pigeons because they come to a T intersection with a skyscraper in the way, they can't make that turn. Pigeons can make their turns better. They are designed for open country fast flight. You get a, they have their chicks when some of our day migrating birds are still moving north. So the black, red winged blackbirds and the grackles and the blue jays are still flying north when they're wanting to feed their chicks. And if you're sitting in the custom house or here over the Charles River looking out and you see a, a say a blue jay migrating across Boston Harbor, that bird's got nowhere to go. Absolutely nowhere to go. So it's a fait accompli. As a result, I can't think of another wild animal that's got so much free time. You wake up in the morning, you stretch, you preen, you get hungry, you go kill something, you eat, you got the rest of the day off. <laughs> so here is the lowest peregrine falcon nest we've ever had. It's in downtown Haverhill, and it's, let's see, one, two, three, up about four stories on that gutter right there. It was um, on the, just on the top of that old building, and uh, we raised, ended up having two out of the four chicks survive there. They nested in a spot like that, they nested one year, and they moved off to a bridge, and now they're moving off to other places. So they don't always stay in the same place, but if they get a really good place, so the custom house, they've been in it since 1980, uh, 80, uh, what did I say, seven. Um, bridges. It used to be we would have to throw ropes up from boats and try to figure if we could reach them, climb up underneath bridges. Not anymore. We have this wonderful relationship with the Department of Transportation now, and we get to use a snooper truck. This is a $700,000 piece of equipment. The state owns two of them, one for Eastern Mass, one for Western Mass. And they take us to, let's say, the Mass Turnpike, give us a state trooper, close the lane, we get out and go over the edge and have a boat underneath because OSHA requires it and I'm more worried about a chick jumping. But, uh, you know, I've yelled down, uh, guys, what, what are you here for? Uh, rescue. And I said, more like a recovery. Um, if, we, if we were to fall, it would not be a good thing from some of these bridges. Some of them are really high. Um, but this is uh, Jeff Corwin. Anybody heard of Jeff Corwin? He's a, he's a nature celebrity. He, he grew up here in Mass. He lives uh, um, uh, here in Massachusetts. Uh, he's been doing um, Ocean Mysteries, uh, uh, sponsored by the Georgia Aquarium. And so we went under, did a filming session. Uh, that's me with Jeff and one of our peregrines, and that's the box there. These trucks, though, are incredible. They're like a cherry picker, but they rise up, they go out, they go down, they go in, they go back up. So got lots of elbows on this. It's a bridge inspection truck is what it is. So that makes it really easy for us. So let's get into some, this is the, it was on that, that photo in the past one was the Calvin Coolidge Bridge. So Route 9 Bridge in Northampton. And so here is um, a bird, 73 over BD. By golly, we put the band on upside down. Isn't that a bummer? <laughs> if you got these feel readable bands, it's nice to put them on right side up. <laughs> oh, you can't, you can't always be perfect. So at any rate, uh, born in, um, in uh, 2014 and now was in the, when this, bird, this photo was taken was nesting in Woburn on an old quarry wall. This is the kind of nest we do not use. 
This, this is a nest that is put up in the New Jersey salt marshes. And the, uh, if you went down to Brigantine, one of the first breeding pairs bred on a tower in Brigantine, uh, New Jersey. Um, so I'm a little concerned about getting our peregrine falcons. These are predatory birds, but too close to some of the other birds we're concerned about, like piping plover and terns. And you know, they, they're like bringing wolves back to Yellowstone. They're going to eat something. And if it's something common, if they'd eat turkeys and geese in mass, I wouldn't worry about it. But they don't. They eat smaller things. Grackles, grackles would be good. So, well, actually, their most popular, people think they eat pigeons, all the time pigeons. Their most popular thing is starlings. But think about it. Starling is the most abundant bird in North America. So, no wonder. They're going after whatever's easy. They're not picky. They don't care what, what uh, kind of bird it is. They just care that it's the right size and it's available. So starling is the most available, it's the most frequently taken. Pigeon is about number five or six. Um, and the reason DOT really loves us is because pigeon poo is acidic enough, it enhances the, the corrosion on their bridges. And when we get a pair nesting on a bridge, the pigeons might nest on the ends over the land, but they don't nest on the part over the water anymore at all. And so it takes a few years for the birds, the parrots to catch up, but a pigeon flying over that water going to its nest site doesn't fare very well. So DOT has told me literally we have saved them over the years millions of dollars of repair work. And so I'll take the credit yeah. and if they, if they give us the truck and it's a great, it's a great trade. So let's go some of these, through some of these band returns. This is another, you know, another, um, no, this actually isn't. I get to one in a minute that's a, uh, an issue. Um, no, this is it. This is, this is another mistake. The, the males are smaller than the females. This is reverse sexual dimor by dinor dimorphism as we usually think about it. Um, the, things, the, the species in which the males compete, like bison and um, you know, turkeys, that sort of thing, the males are bigger. They, they fluff up, they show off, they, they compete with each other to get access to the females. But with a lot of birds, in raptors in particular, the female is the bigger. She's the nest protector. The male is the hunter, she's the nest protector. And so we have to have two different size bands, one for males, one for females. And you saw that I screwed up and put one band on upside down. Well, that makes it hard. Well, the other thing is, you have to think about your color band sequences. So in the same year, I use 62 over BD for a female and 62 over BS for a male. Now, I thought they would never come together. These two birds are photographed on the same antenna on Plum Island at different times. So you go and you see the second bird on the antenna and you see the, well, it's 62 over B and assume it's the same bird. They're not, they're two different birds. So in the future, I like to move my numbers apart a little bit <laughs> so there's not the confusion that something like this, because we're lucky to be able to see the whole number, but that's 62 over uh, BS, or is that the BS or the BD? Uh, that's the BD. So, got to squint. What's that? What does BS stand for? Not a thing. It's just random numbers. Right now we're using two random numbers over two random letters. And so we'll get, we'll get the BD series from the company that makes the bands and they'll give us one through 99, actually zero, zero through 99 BD. And then we go zero through 99, you know, BF. And then some other combination. So we get thousands of combinations, just totally random. Here is just some beautiful shots. Um, but these are down in the Bronx, in New York. This is one of the, the parks, the coastal parks in New York, um, Orchard Beach in Bronx, 51 over BD. And um, Steve Sachs, who's a, a, a photographer, um, took these uh, at one point in you know, December of 13, took these in January of 14 of the same bird, because we're looking at 51 over BD. And he took others, they're just, you know, really, he's just a great photographer. And, but we're getting good data, and it turns out that this is a puddle in the parking lot. And this puddle in the parking lot, for whatever reason, has been attracting peregrine falcons for years. They come and stop, they're migrating down the coast, and they take a bath. 
and he's gotten, he's gotten about, about six of the birds I've banded in this same puddle. And then, so he does this, like I say, if you go back, this is, in de this is in December, this is in January, he found the bird again, this is still the, the January, and this is in September 2014, complete transition to a full adult plumage, and it's on the Palisade Cliffs in New Jersey, and it's nesting. The same guy found this. So you gotta figure he's, he's spending a lot of time looking for birds if he's finding the same bird multiple times. So here's one, Manchester, New Hampshire. Interestingly, I still banded that bird. Um, they uh, had a, one year where they, their, their bander had retired and I volunteered to go up and, and band one year in Manchester. Well, that bird, six months later, is eating a morning dove down on Plum Island. So they still come back. Um, and then, 16 months later, there it is, transitioned into full adult plumage uh, in Gloucester. So again, the same bird. Without having those bands, we would never know that that's the same bird as the juvenile we had seen earlier. There's no way in the world to connect those dots. Now, we have not used radio telemetry. That has gotten to be spectacular. And they've gotten telemetry units now that have gotten so small that even little small sandpipers can carry them around. So, uh, that is something really cool, but we haven't done that. So here, <coughs> Nashua, New Hampshire, um, 22 over BD, born in Nashua, New Hampshire, um, and uh, V over 46, born in Connecticut, and they're both sitting on a cross of a steeple in Watertown, Mass. So again, you've got New Hampshire bird with a Connecticut bird, rendezvousing in Massachusetts. So interesting combinations. Uh, here's something I tried just as a, uh, a fluke. This is a photograph. Uh, actually, David Ursula's friend took this uh, in Cape May, New Jersey. And that's what the photograph, we were able to blow it up and read that number right, right there and it was 90 over BD. And the question simply was, do you have any idea who the parents might have been? Well, it turns out, yeah, both the parents, this was at, uh, at UMass Lowell, both of the parents were banded I was able to follow, that we've done enough band, we don't band anywhere near all the chicks, nowhere near, but with this bird, I happened to be able to follow it back one, two, three generations to the captive born adult, the captive adults that laid the eggs at Cornell University that were a part of the original restoration program. And on this side of the family, on the male side of the family, one, two, three, four, five, six generations back to the Peregrine Barn again at Cornell University. So this one originally uh, was released, um, let's see, that's the National Park. I yeah, that was uh, a captive release bird in Maine that um, then nested at the uh, um, precipice in Acadia National Park up in um, Bar Harbor, Maine. Um, and this one was released in uh, Borstone Mountain, uh, was owned by the National Audubon Society in Maine. So they are just a, simply a gorgeous bird, no doubt about it. They have been the, the, the choice for royalty for falconry in the medieval, medieval days. If you weren't part of royalty, it was unlawful for you to have one. These are uh, enormously popular uh, in falconry around the world because they are big falcons, very fast, very spectacular, um, and they were not doing well, but the recovery has been essentially complete. We have more peregrine falcons nesting in Massachusetts right now than we've ever had in history. And it's because we don't have that many natural cliffs. The fact that they have moved to um, man-made structures has allowed them to become more abundant. So, as of 2018, we had 41 pairs. We've had two new pairs this year. Um, and it fluctuates a little bit because we've also lost a couple of pairs along the way. So as they go up, I think we've had like 46 total, but if you count the losses, we're at uh, 43 right now. At least 31 pairs have laid eggs. Uh, oh, this actually, I'm sorry, this is in 2008, uh, 18 rather. Um, and you have all those statistics about uh, how many we banded. We banded 48 chicks. 
Um, and it happened to coincide with, this is a record number, all-time record number of migrant peregrines that were seen in the Florida Keys in the fall of 2015. 1,500 peregrine falcons were seen migrating south. Our birds do not migrate, but Falco peregrinus is the name. Peregrinus means wanderer. The birds in the Arctic, we get birds from Greenland. We've had banded birds that I've handled from Greenland. They, ones from Greenland and the Arctic migrate all the way down our coast past us and spend the winter in southern South America. Oh, wow. So they go enormous distances. Our birds, if they nest up in the, in the Adirondacks or the Green Mountains of Vermont, they'll migrate to the coast or migrate south to, to maybe Virginia, and that's about all. Our birds, because we don't have nearly as bad of winters, generally stay right on territory year-round and don't go anywhere. So the farther north you are, the farther south they migrate. In the middle, they don't go anywhere. So since 1987, we have had a total of at least 720 wild-born peregrine falcons in Massachusetts. Um, so that's pretty remarkable. Going from zero to having produced. We released, um, let's see, two, four, six, Birds that actually survived the release, we only had maybe eight. But other states had done it too. But out of those small numbers of founding populations, we ended up with over 700 uh, fledged chicks. The population growth, this is, this is an exponential growth curve. And it is almost perfectly matched an exponential growth curve. So this is a multiplying effect as they increase in numbers. I do worry about them a little bit. The one species that's really vulnerable to peregrines is nighthawk. Nighthawks are not very common. They're not doing very well. A lot of it has to do with the fact that in the cities they nest on gravel roofs and most of our gravel roofs are being replaced. But they also are very, very vulnerable to peregrine falcons. So we don't want to wipe something else out in the process of saving one species. And that's why we really do not encourage them to nest near the coast. We have some that nest, or, that nest is almost on the coast, but they're in places that are not that close to turn colonies. They really don't go very far. As I said earlier, they're so efficient, they don't have to go very far to get the food while they're raising chicks. When the chicks fledge and disperse, they often do go to Plum Island or go to Plymouth Beach. And there you do see them catching sandpipers. But we don't want them eating pipe and plover. We don't want them eating uh, roseate terns, which are also rare. and. Um, you know, so far, we've had, I've been collecting all the food items in every nest we've ever been in. We've had two turns so far. They were both in, in Boston at the Custom House. Never had a pipe and plover. Had semi-palmated plover, which is virtually the same thing. So they certainly would take them if they, if they came across them. So, they are adorable. They are adorable. Yes. What's the size of a peregrine falcon? I usually use the common crow as a point of reference. The male peregrine is a little smaller than a crow and the female is a little bigger than a crow. And um, so we're thinking, you think, okay, how big, what are your guesses? What do you think a peregrine falcon might weigh? What do you think? Well, a big female, big fat female peregrine falcon. How much? 10 pounds? 12 pounds? Any idea? Guess? 25? Oh, 1.5. Very close. 1.5 is about right for a male. Might be 2 pounds for a female. Uh, right in that ballpark. They're not very big. A red-tailed hawk, that big hawk you see on the side of the highway, 3 pounds is about as big. 3.5 maybe for a really big female. They're not very big. As a result of that, they cannot carry things very big either. And so, even though this is called the duck hawk, it can only carry the smallest of ducks, buffle heads, wood duck, anything like a mallard or a black duck, it'll kill it on the marsh, but it's got to eat it right there where it falls. They can't carry it off. Yes, what do you want? Are all female peregrine falcons bigger than the male? Yes. 
Huh? I already knew because I watched this. Oh, you already knew that was, you already knew the answer to the question before you asked it? Okay, yes. I'm curious about the size of the territory. For instance, in downtown Boston, how many pairs could you have? I tell you, the two densest places I can think of for nesting are New York City, which is much bigger than Boston, so it's like 20 odd pair, and Metro Boston. Metro Boston has about nine pair, maybe something like that. But every time I think that they're as close as they can get, so Custom House, Christian Science Church. I don't know how far apart that is, but it can't be more than a mile and a half or maybe two miles. We just, this new one we just found at 99 Summer Street in the banking district right now near Chinatown is halfway in between. Cut it in half. When we first had our first two nests, Boston and Springfield, the males were local. The female came in each case, she was captive, born, and released in Toronto, Ontario, 600 miles away. In fact, I was doing Canadian Broadcast Network interviews because the only success Toronto had were two pairs in Boston, in Massachusetts rather, one in Boston, one in Springfield. And um, more recently, we had one born in the Custom House, nested on the Tobin Bridge. Couldn't be half a mile away, maybe one mile. You had a question too. Let's get him first. The small number uh, of birds that you've released, you worry about inbreeding? Um, actually, no. Uh, in the case of peregrines, I had we had nothing to do with the strategy for for releasing what what kind what stock, so to speak, or what the genetic background was of the birds released. But the peregrine fund took in. Uh, three, all three North American subspecies, and actually at least one European subspecies, they wanted, since the eastern peregrine falcon was gone, they wanted more genetic diversity with the idea that as uh, natural stresses played on the birds that they released, it would narrow down the genetic characteristics to mimic what we lost. And I don't know if that's worked or not, but our birds are very genetically diverse. In fact, I'd say more diverse than they, they would have been if, uh, if they hadn't disappeared. Um, so, no, the diversity is good. Now, whether or not it's quite the same thing and whether it's been sort of, you know, selective breeding has changed them, I tell you what, the, the birds we have now look to me to be virtually identical to the historic photos of what we lost. So visually, they look the same. You had a question? Uh, I keep having questions. Um, <laughs> how long do they live? And did the female, when you were banding, do they attack you or do they just hover? And then uh, how do you know about the genetic diversity? Well, genetic diversity, we know. We haven't actually done um, genetic um, profiles on our surviving birds. But what I've done so that it can be done later is every time we've had a mortality, I've tried to save the carcasses, and so Harvard has about 30 dead peregrine falcons or more in their Museum of Comparative Zoology that represent the founding population. So they have tissue samples, they have the genetic material. In fact, it's more like 40. Um, and not to mention others are collected in other states. Um, so the aggression, uh, the females, some females, females that are away from the city are never um, uh, brave enough to be close by. They leave when we go into band. But the ones at the Custom House, most particularly, have always been aggressive. And so when I go, and I, that's, that's the biggest box we have. I have to crawl inside the box to get the chicks. And there's a camera, so I'm crawling by the camera. The female is always there. Uh, trying, if she's not already in the box, I have to open the door slowly, put my hand in, and let her attack my gloved hand. And when she grabs my hand, I just close in on her toes, and I pull her out, and I put her in a zipped up canvas bag. Okay, then. So it's better for both of us. And unbanded birds, I've banded about eight, nine, ten adult females that I was able to capture at the nest that were unbanded. So I banded the adults. Now, that doesn't tell me where they came from, but it does tell me, are, are they still the same female at the same site? How long do they live? So how long do they live? The actual North American record is nine and, uh, 19 and a half years. Oh, wow. And one of our Boston birds at Custom House lived 19 years. Typically, 10 years is a good long run. So what does a 
do the rest of the year when you're not watching them? <laughs> what am I going to do? No, what do the birds do? The birds? What do they do when they're not doing this big nest? They're, they're very happy when no one's watching them. <laughs> um, but you know what? In this day... Do they travel a lot or do they just hang around? No, they, they pretty well hang around. You can look at the cam... Well, not all the cameras are on year-round. Most of them are seasonal. But when we had the camera year-round in the custom house, you could see the falcon, the adults coming into that box every month of the year. That's a home base for them? That well, they're just checking it out. And the, but yes, that's, the, that's the, the center of their home range. Now, they do overlap. So the airport, the airport is by far the best habitat anywhere nearby in New England. It is the biggest piece of Arctic tundra, artificial Arctic tundra we have. That's why all the snowy owls end up at Logan Airport. And so the peregrines will go out there from the metro Boston area and we'll get adults from three, at least three if not four different pairs co-mingling at, at Logan Airport. Because there are other birds there for them to catch? Oh, there's lots of things at Logan Airport to catch. Logan Airport, they actively kill birds on the runway if they think they're a threat to uh, aircraft, but it is a magnet for birds. Yes? So, like, why does the, um, why do they why do they keep, like, like switching? Switching? Female, female, male, female, male, female. Oh, why do they switch? Um, well, they, they come together and bond the mother and the father. And if one of them dies, then they get another mate. The, the, so they, um, they rebond. They marry. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I shouldn't point. I'll let. <laughs> I need all the help I can get. <laughs> I, I just wanted to ask. I'm very interested. And may I ask about falconry? That to me is amazing that they can train these birds to catch other birds. I wonder how I can find out about falconry. So, so how does it work? Or yes, I mean, how, oh, how it's, do they work and how do they train? Them? It's actually very simple. Um, so, in falconry, first of all, falconry is hundreds of years old. Uh, medieval England was doing it. The, the, um, uh, in Saudi Arabia and in nearby countries, the Middle East, they, this falconry had been going on forever. Um, uh, Siberia with um, 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 golden eagles. Um, so you get a, a young bird. Well, actually, you don't even need to get a baby bird. You can trap a bird. Usually it's a juvenile bird in migration, so it's a fully wild bird. Never been around a person ever in his life. And you put Jesse's on its legs, which have little leashes that you have short that can hold it on your fist. It doesn't like you to start with, but you become the source of food. And some falconers literally will sleep with their bird in the same cage with their bird for a few days or a week so that they get used to each other. Um, and by the fact that you're feeding that bird, you're the source of food, it learns that really quick. <laughs> and so then you start to get it to come to you to get food. You put it out some distance and let it fly with a big long leash on it first and let it come to your fist to get food off your fist. So you're the home, you become the home base, the place to get the food. And so when you go to hunt one, you weigh it every day and you make sure that when you go to hunt, it is very hungry. And so you don't want to release a, a satiated or a, a bird that's recently fed, because it'll just leave. But you, you fly a hungry bird, it'll go out and just do what it normally does. They are just instinctively good hunters. So for a falcon, it gets up in the air and soars until something jumps up. You go out there with your bird dog, you flush a pheasant, and kaboom! <laughs> And they don't get it all the time. They miss oftentimes too. But when they get something, they bring it to the ground and they stand on it and they get ready to start eating. You walk up and you get the bird off the prey. You give it a prize to eat. And if you mess up and you don't know where that bird went down and it feeds and gets a full stomach, it's gone. So you always have to keep it hungry. You gotta keep it hungry. Eagle huntress is a good thing. What an amazing lecture and how you have taught us all about this amazing <laughs> bird and what you have done for so many years. Congratulations to Thank you. Thank you. What I, my question is, uh, what kind of organization do you have? How many people like you are willing to get out of a 35-story window? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> OSHA won't let us anymore. When we had our first nest, it was our second nest in the state, but the first nest year at the Monarch Place building in downtown Springfield, the ch one of the chicks was choking on something and, and we wanted to rescue it. And the window wouldn't open. We were going to go down by uh, window cleaning, derrick, and all that kind of stuff. But it was going to take hours to set up. And they, they do that on contracts. They didn't have one on site anyway. I said, well, can I tie off and go down with my ropes? They said, sure. I tied off on a 25-story balcony railing and repelled off the side of the skyscraper. <laughs> and uh, let me tell you, they wouldn't let me do that today. <laughs> But it's safe. I mean, what do you know? What do you think? You know, people that are rock climbing, they they don't have the sort of the safety backup. They 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 do. They have good equipment. If you trust your equipment, it's not scary. But are there the, many people doing? It? Well, not the combination, but there's a lot of people doing rock climbing. There are a lot of people not afraid of heights. But interestingly, in Vermont, where I was banding up there. Our very first climbers were from the uh, military's Alpine Warfare Training School in Vermont. They brought down their training, their climbing instructors, and they climbed from the bottom to the top. It took two and a half hours. This guy that did the climb was the most fearless person I've ever seen and most agile person I've ever seen. He got to the top of the cliff, and mom came in. He damn near jumped off the cliff. He was scared to, de he was scared to death of the bird. Two and a half pound bird had nearly freaked him out. The next year they wouldn't come. So I tied off on a tree on the top of the cliff. I don't know how to rock climb. I know how to rappel. You just tie off on a tree and go down your rope, went into the thing, into the, into the ledge, banded the chicks, and I used Jumars, call it cinders, to climb back up the rope. I did it in an hour. They did it in two and a half hours. So, and I'm not a climber. I'm a repeller. Um, I have a question. What's the difference between a peregrine falcon and an osprey? Ooh, oh, a lot of difference actually. Yeah. Um, there's a whole, well, first of all, size. Osprey is a big, long-winged and skinny-winged, but, but not skinny and sharp. Uh, good crook in his elbows, different flight shape. A bird that has an incredible ability to, to see a fish in the water, dive down, catch it in his talons, and from the water, even go under the water a little bit, bob to the surface, and from the water be able to flap those big wings and get up off the water. Almost no bird, except for a duck or something that's got webbed feet, can literally bring itself up. Now, our bald eagles will often come down and catch a fish that's too big or catch a loon or a duck on the water and can't carry it, and they'll end up in the water, in the drink. They cannot fly up. But boy, they do a wonderful butterfly stroke. To get, <laughs> and they'll drag that prey item right to the beach. And I've watched numerous eagles swim uh, off Quabbin Reservoir or the Merrimack River and swim to shore with a food item. Yeah, Tom, on uh, peregrine falcons, I've seen them where they're attacking a duck over some mud flat or something like that. And apparently, unlike other hawks and falcons that sort of grab with their toes and squeeze, it, it looked like they were fisting it. Mm -hmm. It just, it's because usually it's a surprise that ducks or a flock of ducks are going by and it comes in at 100, 200 miles an hour and pounces on it and then it falls down rather because it'll lose those long fingers at that kind of speed. But I just want to relate something. I've been working on cruise ships, the Rhodes Scholar, for a bunch of years in the Caribbean. And in southbound migration, October, November, this peregrine falcon sitting on our ships, grabbing any migrant birds coming towards it just in those months. But in December, when the migration to Latin America is over, and in January and February, no peregrine falcons in the ocean. But come March and April, especially between Cancun and Cuba and the Cayman Islands, there's peregrines on every ship. But the more important thing is you think about where are the ones that don't, that are not resident in Boston, what do they do as they head south? As you may know, out in the Gulf of Mexico, off Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, there's thousands of natural gas like the Deepwater Horizon and oil platforms out there where there were never any islands. And there's huge numbers of our songbirds that have just come back to Concord, winter in southern Central America, South America, they come up in Yucatan across that Gulf of Mexico. And now there's a peregrine falcon sitting on every one of those artificial islands eating the poor little Orioles, Stanagers, whatever. And they're just sitting there, they can see the headwinds and the rain coming down. Oh, God, another thing I'd have to kill. As it gets close, it just flies out and grabs it. Um, 
economy, but it's interesting that all those natural gas and oil platforms are maybe altering the balance of nature. Whether you love peregrines, you love the songbirds, there's a, there's a big impact out there. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, thank, thank you. I've enjoyed it. Thank you so much.